Welcome to the Good and Basic Podcast, a long-form conversation between Joseph and Joseph, where we talk about all the fun stuff we do on our channel and the ideas behind them. And today we're talking about stuff we did not do on the channel, and so it's <laughs> going to be extra fun. Yes, exactly right. As you know, uh, we are back from our brief hiatus. It uh, ended up being three weeks instead of two weeks, so um, we apologize for that. It ended up being the best thing, and so uh, this is this is our first video back, and then uh, tomorrow we'll be back on our regular posting schedule yep. um, with awesome stuff. Um, you can find our social media information in the show notes and our video description, as well as a link to the audio-only podcast or to the YouTube channel if you happen to find the podcast, but not the YouTube channel. Which would be amazing. If you <laughs> happen to be that person, please leave a comment. We'd love to meet you. Yes, we would. Um, so uh, let's see. Yeah, so uh, as Joseph said, we are not talking about videos that we put on the channel this uh, this time around because we didn't put any videos on the channel last week. Instead, we're going to tell you about what we uh, what we did with our summer vacation. As about it were. your Walden-like experience yeah, out yeah, in yeah, the yeah. wilderness and about my adventures touring a particular college campus and doing a certification. So Yeah, so, yeah both Josephs were, were out in the wild in separate places. Uh, uh, one Joseph was in southern Utah. Yes. Monticello. And then I went up to the Uintas, which was also wonderful. So we literally did rock, paper, scissors to figure out who was going to <laughs> tell about what happened first. And, and I, we didn't decide what rock, paper, scissors, whether it was that you won and went first or lost and went first. But but somehow I ended up going first. So I'm going to tell you a little bit uh, about uh, what I did in the Uintas. So I went camping and I, I, I just went camping alone. I didn't go to a campsite. Uh, what I actually did was I got in my Mustang and I drove until people were giving me funny looks because they were on four wheelers and I was in a sports car. And that was when I knew I was far enough in the boonies that it was, it was, it was, it was time thing. to camp. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so the, the, the brief outline is I, I, I went up into the Uintas um, to, to camp for a few days, not at an established campsite. I was near a place called Iron Mine Mountain. There were a couple uh, high alpine ponds, which was cool. Um, it, the, the Uintas are a mountain range in Utah that uh, tends to get a little cold. The weather's a little, uh, the, the weather changes there pretty drastically. It's like a, uh, there's some quaking aspens, but it's mostly, it's mostly uh, evergreen trees, rocky, a lot of lakes, a lot of little creeks running everywhere. Um, so that, that kind of terrain. Um, it's an incredibly wild landscape. It, yeah, yeah, it it is yeah. um, full of marshes and beavers and all kinds of stuff. And, yeah, and if, one of the largest deposits of quartzite on the planet. Oh, is that true? It is. I did not know that. It's one of the few mountain ranges on the planet that is not growing. It's actually shrinking over time, but it's made out of an incredibly weather-resistant rock, and so it's still there. If I had known, I would have tried to go find some. I, I specifically went to a place called Iron Mine Mountain because I was I was hoping to find some iron ore. I did not. Uh, I I walked around a large portion of the mountain. And I was not able to find any mine, and so I'm not sure what's going on there. I don't know why it was named that, but. Uh, that's Misnomer. a little unfortunate. It's yeah. Greenland. It's the Greenland <laughs> it's of Iron Greenland. Mines. <laughs> it's the Greenland of Iron Mines, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so the, the reason why I did this and the reason why I'm, I'm telling you about this is I want to connect it to uh, to Henry David Thoreau's trip to Walden Pond. So uh, Henry David Thoreau is an American author in the 1800s. He's uh, known for a few things. He wrote a book on civil disobedience. Which he inspired an, Gandhi and Martin Luther King Jr., among others. Uh, he wrote an essay on walking, which is also quite good, actually. And, but maybe one of his best-known books is, is Walden, which experience, it's, it's the tale of his experience living at this place called Walden Pond in Massachusetts. Uh, basically, he just tells the whole world, hey, I'm peacing out for a year. I, th- I think it's a year, two years, something like that. Um, and, and he just goes and lives in a little shack next to Walden Pond. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's a staple of American literature. It's a real staple of American literature. So I, the, the important thing that I want to point out is um, I want to address one of the misconceptions about Walden Pond, I think. It's and not it's, a survival story. Yeah, so it's not really a survival story, and it's not about him, like, it, it's not about him uh, achieving unity with nature uh, in, in, in some kind of hippie fashion. It's not that, right? So it's not a survival camp, and it's not, it's not him trying to achieve uh, mystical unity with nature, at least not exactly. Uh, you know, he goes in regularly to have his clothes washed. He buys food. His He's, mom washed his laundry yes. throughout the experience. So, so. <laughs> loses some awesomeness points for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, he had lots of visitors. He actually kept three chairs in the cabin for visitors. And if I if I remember rightly, I believe he said he had more visitors while he was living at Walden Pond than he did when he was living in town. Uh, the point being, this was not exactly, you know, he, he was kind of roughing it in a way because he was moving away yeah, from everything, sure. living in living, the cabin living the next, to the lake. next to the lake. But this was not like Bear Grylls. It sure. just wasn't. No. Right. Um, and and the, the, the thing that I want to point out is that 
Henry David Thoreau, as far as I can tell, never meant for it to be like hardcore survival camp. So what did he mean for it to be is the question. Yes. yes. And actually, so I, I want to read, well, uh, and, and this is one of the places this is exemplified is, is at the end of the book. Um, he says, I, I went back to civilization for just as good as reasons as I left it. Okay. I went to the woods for very good reasons. I went back from the woods for very good reasons. Anyway, th- there's there's a quote that I actually want to read. Um, Reaches for a laptop. Yeah. Because uh, cause it, 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 it really nails it out. So he says, sorry, this might take me just one moment. I apologize. Um, no worries. It's interesting to me. Um, Walden is a book that when I was 13, 14, I was really interested in survival books, and I had it recommended to me at one point, and I found out it was mostly philosophy and said, well, I'm not going to read that. That's not a real survival book, so I'm going to skip it. But as I've gotten older, um, I actually think that that is more of a draw. I want to know what he was looking for, whether he found it, and whether what he found was good. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, and even though it's not really a survival manual by any means, he does actually give some practical tips about how he lived. You know, he talks sure. about a few of the problems that he faced and how he overcame them. So actually, in some ways, it, w- it was funny. Uh, as I was thinking about it, I was like, that's not that different from what we're doing with our YouTube channel. Is, you know, we're not, we're not anti-technologists. We're just trying to figure out how to make the thing work a little better. By going back to basics. And so we're so sharing some some tips about that. When, when you strip out all the extraneous details, yeah. or when, when you simplify, you have to go through a prioritization process where you figure mm-hmm. out what can be left behind. And yes. All you're doing really is investigating the thing to see what is important and good from it mm-hmm. by doing that process of stripping away details. Uh, speaking of simplifying, that's a famous quote from Thoreau, right? Simplify, simplify, simplify. Really? But um, yeah, I, I, I am 90% sure. I didn't realize that was him. Let, cool. Let's pretend that the answer is yes and, and go from there. <laughs> um, so so here's, here's the quote anyway. So here's, here's what he says. I went to the woods because I wished to live deliberately to front only the essential facts of life and to see if I could not learn what it had to teach and not, when I came to die, discover that I had not lived. Ooh. I did not wish to live what was not life because living is so dear, nor did I wish to practice resignation unless it was quite necessary. I wanted to live deep and to suck out all the marrow of life, to live so sturdily and Spartan-like as to put to rout all that was not life, to cut a broad swath and shave close, to drive life into a corner, Reduce it to its lowest terms. Super good and basic. Reduce there. it to its lowest, or we would say most basic terms. Yeah. And if it proved to be mean, why then to get the whole and genuine meanness of it and to publish its meanness to the world? Or if it were sublime to know it by experience and to be able to give a true account of it in my next excursion. Or if it were sublime. That would be the great name for a book. Or if it were sublime. That is a good book name. Gosh. Right. Um, okay, so, so so things that I'm pulling yeah. from that, right, is so so he uh, the question is something of okay, so wait, what is essential? What is of highest value? What is what do you need life really to survive, of? but to live? Uh huh. And we're going to strip it down to an almost quasi survival situation. Well, it's it's less simplifying it to a quasi situation. Well, actually, no, this is this is good because this is exactly the question is so how do you figure out what the basic facts of life are? And yes. and I don't think. I, think, I don't think it was that he was stripping it down to a survival situation. I think it was that he was placing himself in a largely new and different set of circumstances so that he could compare the two experiences mm-hmm. and figure out. Uh, by comparing two things, you can figure out the differences, and then you start to notice salient details. There's details that you can't notice because you're immersed in them. Yes. But if you have two different contrasting situations, then you can start to notice... Uh, you can start to know what each situation is by its contrast to the other. One thing that was really interesting to me, so we did a survival camp when we were about 18, um, which was a dismal, hilarious failure. And if you want to hear the long story about that one, we can leave a link to the other show where we talked about it. But one of the things that stood out to me is as we were doing the survival camp, what do you do during the day? Mm -hmm. I always imagined myself like crafting things because I like crafting things, like making things from scratch, Mm -hmm. but you can only do that so much. Yeah. And then, you know, you have 16 hours of daylight, so what do you do with them? And I ended up just sitting against a tree being some of the most, I, I, I don't remember feeling a more intense feeling of boredom in my life. Mm-hmm. So that was a really interesting thing. So what is the meaning of being alive? Like when we were in that quasi-survival situation, that was one of the problems I wrestled mm-hmm. with was, okay, what's the point? Mm-hmm. What are we doing? And that would be an interesting thing to tease out to the point where you could f- say, no, 
I, I can find contentment meaning in mm-hmm. a stripped down format. Yeah. Well, and, you know, I did something similar to to Thoreau in that although I was out in the woods and in, you know, roughing it, air quotes, um, I, I was I was not suffering. Right. Like I drove up in my car. I, br- I, I brought plenty of fresh water. Uh, I slept in a hammock, which was very nice, and my face did not get eaten off by a bear at 2 a.m., which you was also talk wonderful. You need to talk about that story because that's so, a good story. <laughs> so that was great. Um, you know, like I brought plenty of food. Uh, you know, I, 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 I brought a gun and did some target shooting. You know, like I was, I was just not suffering, right? Like I was not suffering. Um, but it's interesting. Even then, I still had an acute sense of uh, of trying to figure out what was worth my time like what I was going to use to occupy the day. Like there were distinct moments where I was like, I have four more hours of daylight, right? And then, you know, what what am I going to do with those four hours of daylight? Because when the sun goes down, right, like it's it's over, right? All of a sudden the thing, the list of things I can do becomes very, very, very constricted. Sure. Right. Um, and, and and so 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 my, my my point is that being placed in that different situation, which like you said, is, you know, quasi survival, you know, at least different, at least with a lot of elements stripped away, um, forced me to ask a lot of questions. Okay, well, wait, what am I doing? And how valuable is that? Right. Um, I, you know, it made me live deliberately and consciously, right? Front only the essential facts of life, right? So that I did not come to the end of the day and find out that I had wasted all that daylight, right? Um, to not wish to live what was not life, living is so dear, nor to practice resignation unless it's quite necessary. Instead, it's to like, you want to figure out, no, like, wait, what, what, is it that would, what is it that would stop life from being tedious? What is it that would stop it from being boring? What is it that would stop it from being meaningless? And, and Thoreau's answer is, well, I need to get placed inside a different situation, maybe even a kind of a quasi-survival situation. And it's, it's doing that that's going to enable me to live deliberately mm-hmm. rather than unconsciously. So one thing I'd like to ask you about yeah, is yeah. is the very subjective experience of what it was like for you to do this. Because initially when we were talking about it, you were saying, you know, I, I'm in my mid-20s and I can afford to just take a week and disappear. No mm-hmm. no wife, no dependents. Yeah. And so, I mean, that's a thing that you can do and you kind of want to see what happens if you do. Yeah. And then you, you came back with like this excitement. Yeah. So subjectively... Very subjectively, what was it like? What were you bored? I I don't think I was ever bored. What I was was very self conscious in a way about what I was doing, um, and w- what I mean by w- I wasn't bored was I always had something to do. Like I brought a couple books up, I had some writing to do. You know, there's some great hikes in the Uintas. I mean, every direction there's a great hike in the Uintas. The right? Uintas are a great hike. That's yes. kind of the nutshell <laughs> That's version. The, the, like, <laughs> the, the whole Uintas, too, yeah. Um, this is not an ad for the Uintas, by the way, but they really are that good. If, if the Uintas could pay me to advertise for them, I probably would. Because um, <laughs> the Uintas are pretty great, man. Talk I, to the mountain. You know, and there were also some really great serendipities along the way, right? Uh, um. Uh, my, my first day up, I was doing some hiking. I was trying to hike to the top of Iron Mountain, Mountain, and I found wild raspberry bushes growing, like a lot of wild raspberry bushes. And so my lunch was wild raspberries. And that was a really cool moment, too, right, to like to, to not just find food in the wild, but to actually find like really palatable, delicious. Something you would recognize as food. We're not talking about grubs and roots. We're talking about like food food, yeah. like grocery store food. Yeah. And Except so that was fresh and yeah. wild from the mountain. So there were some wonderful serendipities, too. So I would never say I was bored because I always had something to do. But I would say that because it defamiliarized me from my ordinary daily routine, I had to be very conscious of what I'm doing. You know, because uh, because in your ordinary daily life, you do fall into a lot of routines. You just do, right? Uh, you know, you 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 check your email, uh, you check your social media, uh, you you get on YouTube, um, yeah, you what, whatever ruts. it is. You, you just live in the rut. Yeah, you just live in the ruts, right? And so, you know, although I, I hope it doesn't sound too hackneyed, but like getting shaken out of that rut is really valuable. And the reason why is because if you're shaken out of that rut, then you start living deliberately. It's not because the rut is bad. It's because you need to live deliberately. You need to be aware of what's going on and be making those decisions. The thing that you as a human being were meant to do is to make, to make choices. 
And if you live too much in a rut, you can, the, the one choice you make in the day is run program. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it's not a very satisfying way to live, right? No. Like it, 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 you know, it's, it's like using a boulder to crush an ant. You're way, like human beings are, are way over, uh, what's the word? We're, we're way too, ca- yeah, we're, we're way too capable to, to waste our day uh, not not living not consciously, choosing, not, not living deliberately, right? Not making choices, not yeah. not thinking about consequences and yeah. weighing options and saying what's good and bad. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and and this is why, like Thoreau, living qualitatively, uh, yeah, and and Thoreau Thoreau had more visitors, right? So, like in some respects, his sociability and his quality of life, like, actually went up. His right? advertising feature was, "Hey, I live in the woods. Do you want to come and experience yeah, the woods? Which come is... and visit me in my living room, <laughs> yeah. which is my only room." Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so in some respects, his quality of life even went up, even according to like the metrics of quote unquote civilized society, right? Like he had more visitors. Sure. Like this rural living actually had city living beat on its own terms in some respects. Um, and then at the end, he says, you know, like I, I went back for just as good as reasons as I came to the woods, you know, like I was not trying to. I, I, it, it was not a rebellion against civilization so much as it was an attempt to be able to properly discern the value of what I had already been doing for years. And then to be able to, you know, when you come back, you're like, okay, you know, some things I'm going to leave by the side of the road. I'm going to leave behind me. And some things I'm going to pick up and 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 they will be better because I'm going to be seeing them with fresh eyes. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, but but I think, you know, the overall thing was just this this idea of living, of, of, of living deliberately and, and the... The, the fact that when you get, when you reduce the terms of your life, it makes it easier to live deliberately because there's there's fewer distractions and it's harder to fewer just variables. do the same thing. Yeah. Fewer moving parts, fewer mm-hmm. factors. Yeah. Well, you know, and I also, in, in some respects, had a limited set of choices. I wonder if no, there's some virtue on. That's in that. The, that's not quite right, but I'm, I'm trying to figure that out. Go ahead. Well, I, I mean... One of the problems that we have with the modern world is complexity, like radical, mm-hmm. unfettered, massive complexity. Mm-hmm. And so there, there's a, there are reasons why we use routines and ruts, and that's partially because life is so darn complicated that it is in many ways preferable to live in a rut. Mm-hmm. And for very rational reasons. Yeah, absolutely. Trying to weigh everything at once is a recipe for chaos, and you don't know... If it's too complicated, A, you don't know which choice of all the many ones you make is the best. And mm-hmm. B, if you make that choice, you have no way of comparing it and its outcomes with all the other outcomes that might have been. Mm-hmm. And so you're left in this place where you can't make decisions because you don't have anything to base them on. Yeah. It's like you're treading treading water. Yeah. Well, and it's funny you should mention treading water because I think a lot of people do feel kind of like they're drowning in the modern world. A little bit. Right. And, the, and that drowning is the right sort of metaphor. You know, that you're surrounded by something that you can't quite manage. Yes. Yes, and it's over your head. That's an analogy we use a lot. And, yeah, and it, and and it that, requires constant effort just to just to, just to tread water. It right. chokes you out. Like, yeah. that, that the pressure and the too muchness can, yeah. can actually do you harm. Yeah. 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 Exactly. So, yeah, I think... Uh, actually, there is one more small thing I want to mention, which is... Uh, I also realized this was one of the most alone I've ever, the, the most alone experiences I've ever been in my life. And you describe that incredibly positively. Yeah. Talk about that. Yeah. So, well, it was, it was, it was, I, was I mean, I, I was incredibly alone. There were some other people camping like half a mile down, but like we never exchanged words. We never saw each other. Right. And, you know, the Uintas is a big place. And once you, once you, I, I realized this as soon as I left my campsite to do some hiking because there weren't really trails, is I realized I, I, I had some maps, so I was pretty confident that I wouldn't get lost. And there was still plenty of daylight, so I was, I was you know, yeah. I was covering my backside. But, um, but you know, you realize, like, you, you hike one mile in the Uintas in any direction, and suddenly you are cut off from everything else. Yes. And there is nothing near you. I, facetiously, I would say it's a good place to hide a body. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know. And I mean that in both, both a living body. I mean, it's a good place <laughs> to just disappear. But, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, very, well, yeah, okay. Uh, so... <laughs> so well, and th- th- this is this is interesting because other people are very important, but they can also be part of the clutter that mm-hmm. that makes you drown, right? And so, so for me, it was a very, very, very positive experience to be totally separate. I actually did a lot of talking to myself. I did really? a lot of talking to myself. There's yeah, no well, one, there was nobody, nobody else around. Right? Like, yeah, nobody's going to call me crazy, right? <laughs> you know, and and I, I I do hate 
uh, boredom, so I've uh, developed myself into a very good conversation partner. So, so I, you know, I, I just talk to the smartest person there, right? <laughs> um, okay, that's, so. that's quite good. That's that's good. Yeah. Well. Um, yeah. So so it was it was it was incredibly positive, and I think like uh, here's another thing, right? Is that gosh, how how would I describe it? It's it's something like. You know, you can easily go crazy being alone. Sure. But you can also very easily go crazy being crowded by other people. Yeah. So it's really nice to have some variation. Sure. So that's that's what I think it mostly was in my case was it was very good to 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 be forced to confront myself almost as it were, right? Like, you know, when you're the only conversation the partner in the room, you know, when you ask a question, there's not a lot to distract you from having to answer, right? So when you start asking like difficult questions about like, uh, about what you want to do with your life, about who you are, your character traits, or whatever, right? Like, it actually turns out there's not too many distractions to keep you, you can't from... can't run away from the question. Exactly. Interesting. Exactly. Interesting. Right. Um, the, sorry. There, no, go There's ahead. a mental image, and <clears throat> I just ahead. need to get it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wilson! <laughs> I'm just imagining what, what it was. Like, you're talking to yourself. Eventually, it would be talking to the trees and rocks, and eventually, you'd start having arguments with them, and... It would get personal. <laughs> yeah. I, I wonder I, if, you know, I, you have so many parts of self that end up talking with each other. That's yeah, yeah, how yeah, we yeah. can talk to ourselves um, is we split ourselves into different parts of self and have them kind of hash it out. Yeah. But, I mean, if you were living totally alone, would you start anthropomorphizing everything? And then probably like, you, could, you could say that tree, that tree is, you know, this part of me that I really don't like. And eventually it's like, oh, this hatchet. It's you just cut it down. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I actually yeah. didn't try that. I think if I had stayed there a little longer, it probably would have developed at some point. So I'm going to have to do this again and uh, report back. Okay. So, <clears throat> okay. So, so that's the lesson from 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 my hiking trip in Walden Pond. I meant to do a lot of projects um, on the on the trip, and it just ended up not being that kind of trip. So uh, much more reflective, we'll, much less make stuff and yes. film stuff. So, uh, future, future, future project, future trip. W- one thing I'd like to mention, <clears throat> yeah, go ahead, or or, or ask you yeah, about is. After you came back from this trip, one of the things you mentioned, feeling totally refreshed and yeah. it was really good alone time, is that you want to do it again. Oh, yes. This, this was a thing worth doing not just once. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I'm counting down the days. <laughs> really? <laughs> counting down the days. Uh, yeah. I don't I, I don't know. I want to experiment with it a little bit, right, to see if I can get some good effects by just going up in the mountains all day. But, uh, but yeah. No, I... I'm, I, I have plans to do this again in the in the very near future, and I would I would recommend it. You know, we're we're very fortunate in Utah to uh, be living half an hour, an hour away from, you know, some very beautiful solitude. Yeah. All right. So I wonder if you could. So if, that if you're the... listening to this from New York City, you know, my deepest apologies. I hear there's some nice places in upstate New York. You would know that better than I do. Best of luck. I'm wondering if you could combine that with like the parched corn beef jerky challenge. Yeah, you know that would be that'd be good. So, well, uh, yeah, a little teaser for that. Do you remember the parched corn challenge that we that uh, that I did, where I went for three days with only parched corn? And the big problem was that I was really craving fat and protein by the end, like really craving fat and protein. Sure. So we're going to be pairing it with beef jerky in the near future, and I'm going to uh, play that game again with a little bit more stuff in my back pocket. Sure. A little bit more equipment. So. Gosh, that's interesting. Okay, so I think this is where we talk about Audible. Um, yes. The first thing that I want to say about Audible is that I have not read Walden, and I want to read Walden, and I, I don't have want. a lot of time to sit down and read, and so I'm really <laughs> considering using one of my credits to get Walden and listen to it. I think that would probably be definitely worth my time. Yes. Yeah, so I think that would probably be definitely, gosh. Yeah, that, that would be worth my time. Yeah. I want to do uh, that. You know, one of the, in case you didn't know, uh, Audible is sponsoring our podcast now, which is absolutely wonderful. We love them. We love them to death. Yes. Um, we've both been using Audible for some time now. And uh, uh, we, you know, how do I love the Audible? Let me count the ways. Uh, way, way number, I don't know what number we're on. 722. Sure. No, is, number uh, 722 is four hour car drives. Um, I have an, a, a, an audio jack in my car so I can plug it into my phone, which has Audible. And then before I go on a trip, one of the first things that I do, or rather the last things I do right before I get in the car while I still have Wi-Fi, is I will hurry and download one of my audiobooks so that I can listen to that one on the car. But because I'm not sure if my tastes will change while I'm driving, I need to download two or three. Mm Three is about the right number. If I go over that, then I start running out of, you know, usable space on the phone. And so then I will, you know, put that in and 
I'll listen to a few different audiobooks on the way there. Um, I've also started listening to them with my kids. Mm-hmm. So we were just listening to Moss Flower by Brian Jakes. Oh, stop. It's so good, right? Oh. Um, it was, it was a flash from the past. I read that oh, uh, book when I was like 11, about the same time I fell in love with my wife. So it's got some, some tender memories for me. Um, so that, that's been fun. We've also been listening to Farmer Boy by Laura Ingalls Wilder. So lots and lots of books. I enjoy it tremendously. And four-hour car rides, of which there are a shockingly large number, because now I have Monticello, Utah, which I was visiting, and also going up and touring into Idaho, and everything's about four hours away, apparently. If you'd like to try Audible, and we can pretty much promise you that you do, um, you can follow our special Audible link that uh, is, is linked to, to, to our channel. It's audibletrial.com slash goodandbasic. There's also a link in the show notes. And if you go um, through this link, you will get a free one-month subscription of Audible. There's no commitment. After that, you can quit right at the one-month mark and pay nothing. Or, like us, you can end up paying monthly or yearly fees to continue totally using an awesome it. service. So <laughs> worth it, right? So that's forward slash so good and basic. Um, yes, audibletrial.com forward slash good and basic. Uh, yeah, great, great service. Couldn't say enough good about it. Audible's amazing. So. Yep. Um, all right. Well, you know, speaking of four-hour car rides, I think that is like the uh, appropriate segue into the second portion of this, which yeah. is your whole permaculture thing down in Monticello. So, so unload. The thing that I was doing was I took a two-week two permaculture design course in Monticello, Utah. And I've wanted to do a permaculture design certification for a while. But the real reason I went to do this was to tour and experience Monticello College. So... Um, those of you who are connected with the uh, homeschool community or with the liberal arts education community in general may be aware of the history of uh, a Thomas Jefferson Education. Um, it's a book by Oliver DeMille, which goes into this uh, Socratic uh, Oxford seminar style learning where you sit down a group of students who have all read some, some classic that forces them to grapple with the great ideas, and then they all discuss it with each other. And through the process of discussion, all of them have a chance to probe and push their thought process a little further and over time this sort of education is designed not so much to download information into you I mean some of that happens but this is the kind of education which trains you to think more clearly and to speak more clearly and to be able to process ideas at a rich level and in in our background I mean we met at a high school that was based partially on these ideas And I can't begin to express how helpful that has been for things like this podcast, where Mm -hmm. that's what we do. I mean, we're we're talking great ideas. ideas. Yeah. Yeah. Fundamentally, that's what this is. And the only way you get better at it is by practicing. Mm -hmm. So this is a real thing. Actually, quick story. This literally happened last night. So I was I was driving with my younger brother, who's 18. And uh, I mean, I mean, he's a pretty smart kid, but he literally at one point during the conversation just asked me, just asked me, like, how did you learn to have conversations? Because, because, well, it, sorry, a little bit of self praise here. I apologize for that. But he said, he said, you're really good at it, and uh, and 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 I and I want to learn how to do that. So, how did you learn how to do that, right? And I and I have to say, like, it's it's this it's this practicing of of, of discussions and grappling with with ideas just like this, right? Yeah. Um, that sort of that sort of Oxford model of education, so on and so forth. It is, and so. part of it is is the discussion with your peers, right? So yeah. we're discussing with each other right now, mm-hmm. but also as you read what are called the classics, and by this we just mean really, really good, somewhat challenging books that are full of good ideas. Mm-hmm. Um, when you're reading these, and they tend to be these old, wonderful books, what you're doing is you're effectively having a conversation with someone who may or may not be dead. Mm-hmm. You know, one of these uh, yeah. Rousseau or with uh, Thoreau or with any of these. Mm-hmm these luminaries and as you're you know reading these books if you do it with a critical eye you are mentally having a conversation and saying okay good point there or you're a little weak here and you're able to kind of grapple with them as a peer almost you get to have a conversation with the smartest people who ever lived yeah and that's, that's that in some sense that's the purpose of a liberal arts education yeah. right like yes yeah. <laughs> is 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 you want to be able to have a conversation with the smartest people who ever lived it's an incredible the, gift. the problem is that you know most of them are dead and so you need to talk to them through their books Yes, which unfortunately is like a one-track conversation. However, it is a very good one-track conversation. Well, but you know, also when you get into a group, sorry, we're getting a little off topic now, but when you get into a group, you know, it'll often be the case that the people in that group will ha- start having different, well, they'll have different attitudes about about the, the about whatever that book says. Sure. Right. And so you'll end up somebody taking up the pro-Rousseau position, right? And someone else takes up the anti-Rousseau position and, and someone else takes up the position halfway the between the two. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. So it, it, you know, you have you have Rousseau's champion there. 
Yes. To to smite. <laughs> so, sorry. Uh, so where, where were we? The, the, it's, it's interesting stuff. So the liberal arts education model um, is fascinating to me. The reason why this is important background is because uh, Monticello College is a very small liberal arts college based in Monticello, Utah, which is incredibly rural. Like I said, it's a four hour drive from basically anything. And, um, and I mean, some people consider they're wrong, but they consider Utah to be a four hour drive from almost anything. Yes. I mean, they're wrong. They're but, wrong but, because but it's if not you're a four one of those people who are wrong, then you can think of this as a four hour drive from a four hour drive from everything. Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> I actually have no problem with that. I kind of like that I live in a fairly rural state. But um, so Monticello, Utah, and the liberal arts education, uh, Oxford model discussing these things and meeting with a mentor now and again to flesh out the ideas further. Now, I, I like that model. It's been of great benefit to me, but I see a drawback in, I always say, a pure liberal arts education. The root of the word liberal arts comes from the word liber, which is a Latin word referring to the bark of a tree, also the material that they were using to make paper for books, so it's like a book education. But it also over time came to be the word that meant freedom. So there Hence, were multiple oh yeah, classes of people. Sorry. There's the slave class in Rome, and then there's the free class. If you're a member of the free class, you are liber which is kind of an interesting thing that they associate that. So a liberal arts education fundamentally is supposed to be a, an education that qualifies you and trains you and makes you the kind of person that can permanently be a member of the free class. Uh, just because you haven't mentioned it yet, I'll also mention the, the most obvious etymology that comes out of it, which, which is liberty. 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 So it's, yep. the, it, it, it's the kind of education that gives you liberty, that makes you free. That makes you free. Free in the mind first. Um, the downside with this type of education that I've noticed or, is... Or the kind of education that free people get. I mean, you, you could argue about that, but anyway, that's, chicken a, that's a side problem. issue. That's a side issue. It's the kind that free people pursue or it's the kind that makes you free. There's a causation yeah. relationship in there somewhere. Yeah. But uh, one of the things that I, I've been... Um, uh, what One trend I've noticed is that those who receive liberal arts educations tend to be, A, more, uh, shall we say, useless... <laughs> that I would like. Ouch. Yeah, I, I'm going to throw it Ouch. out there. So, I mean, uh, you walk out of how the can education. You, I just finished a Master of Arts in English, <laughs> Joseph. This, this hurts. This hurts. Well, here's the problem <laughs> is you have really, really good soft skills. You can think. You can analyze. You can write. You can discuss. You can persuade. Mm -hmm. These are these are powerful tools. And we've yeah. talked about rhetoric before. It's a big deal. Yeah. But you, can you change a tire? No, that's not part of that education. And so in terms of specific hard skill verbs that you can do, the list is quite small. And occasionally, because this is a, kind of a, a blue blood sort of education, kind of an upper class thing, mm -hmm. um, it can come with some entitlement. Mm -hmm. um, I know how to think and you where, don't. Where is my group of unwashed masses to lead? Yes. Where are these hordes of unwashed masses that should be following my every whim? Yes. Um, because, and because I have the leadership education. Therefore, so I, I am a leader. a leader. Which yes. means I need followers. Yes. Where, where are, are my followers? followers? Where is where's my flock of sheep? <laughs> yes. So that, that's a problem. I don't like that entitlement. And I think it's a dangerous thing. And so one of the things that Monticello College, brand new liberal, liberal arts college, is doing that I think is fascinating and really cool is they've combined this idea of liberal arts education with Georgic education, meaning farmer education, from geo, meaning the word for the earth, like yeah. geography. And so there's this idea that um, the way to get get practical skills and to develop freedom kind of of the body where you know where your food comes from and you know how to make it yourself and mm -hmm. you, you are free in the, I can make it from scratch if I had to. I can do the whole Bear Gorillas walk into the wilderness with a, you know, a pocket knife and walk out with my own civilization or at least yeah. a, a functioning farm. Um, that's part of the education here. So the students are reading these heavy books and discussing them through the day. But in the evening, they go and do their farm chores. And the next morning, they do a, a short 20 minutes of solitude while they watch the sunrise, and then they do um, farm chores again, and then they do construction projects every Saturday. And I think that is incredibly cool because in my mind, that, that helps you to build the... Um, it, it helps you to retrain the idea of liberal arts education from being leadership education, which I think is a terrible idea uh, because it implies that you will be the leader of someone else. And trains it to be freedom education. Uh, certainly about. a terrible idea if taken wrongly. I'm just yes. going to insert that because... If taken wrongly. Yes. Maybe I'm just but, taking but it no, wrongly. Well, but, hey, you know... But the, the it's core a idea... Discussion. The core idea is that you are training yourself to be free. You are training uh, mm -hmm. this person to be free, not training yourself to be a leader of others, mm -hmm. training yourself to be a leader of yourself. Well, and it's very interesting, right, that, that 
that somebody's conception of freedom should be somebody leading somebody else. That's not my ideal model of, of, of freedom or a no. free society, right? Now, now, look, you know, there's some, 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 some of that is, is absolutely necessary and good, right? Um, in, in a variety of contexts. If you're doing things in a group, it's very nice to have at least some hierarchy, at least some decision-making <clears throat> authority or operations or frameworks. Otherwise, you know, you've all been in groups like this where stuff just moves in circles forever. And it's like, okay, that's actually not helpful. But, you know, the, the really, you, you know... A, a free society is a society where power and capability and competence are distributed as widely as possible yes. and, and responsibility, where all those things are distributed where as widely you, as possible. Where you can trust the average person in society to be able to, uh-huh. A, manage their own stuff reasonably well, well and B, to avoid getting and, in trouble. And actually, I think G.K. Chesterton says something about this that, uh, you know, normally when we think of democracy, what we think of is people voting, right? If yes. the people are voting and we have majority rule, that's a democracy. And there's there's a quote, I can't remember the exact quote, but it gave me much more the impression that his... Uh, the, the quote was something like that the premise of democracy is that ordinary people should be able to make the decisions about their own lives, should be able to make the majority of decisions about their own lives, right? And so, so that's a different model of, of democracy. That's a different way of looking at democracy. It's not, okay, we need everybody to vote and we need everybody to follow majority rule. Instead, it's, no, the premise of democracy is that the majority of responsibility gets pushed to the individual. individual. Yeah, it's that it's that every individual is is the locus of responsibility and authority. Yeah, not not the not everybody in a group, although there's responsibility and authority there too, but that every individual can be considered a locus of authority and responsibility that they make the decisions about their own life. Yep. So, I agree with that, and I like it. Um, the reason why I went down to do this two-week permaculture design course in a nutshell was to tour and experience the Monticello College campus where the permaculture design course was to be held. And I did things like I volunteered to help the students with their chores in the morning to help understand what that was like. And I tried talking with the students to try to get a sense for what this what this project was like, what kind of person was willing to come here. Because right now the college is incredibly small. Um, they have somewhere in the realm of like 10 students. I mean, it's, it's a small, small number. But the plan is for it to grow over time, and the project is insanely cool. And they're doing stuff with uh, all, teaching the students construction, teaching the students farming, teaching, like, it, it's incredibly cool. And then the quality of discussion was excellent. I had discussions about uh, the, the relative advantages and disadvantages between monarchy and democracy with some of the students, and that was really cool. Mm-hmm. And about responsibility, and I, it was just, it, it was heartening for me to see that there is a place like that. And frankly, I would love to get involved. I would love to do something related to that school because, I don't know, there's something deeply right about that mixture of the great ideas and the basics. Yeah, so let's let's talk about that mixture, if you don't mind, a little bit more. Actually, the other thing I was thinking of is Japanese farmers. Do you want to mention that right now? Oh, yeah. Well, are, are you referring to the Shinto shrine thing? Yes. Okay. I, so I believe so. There's a book, um, which I don't know if you can find this one on Audible, but if you can't, then... I recommend it, and if you can, I also recommend it. We'll leave some kind of link in the show notes. It's called The One Straw Revolution by a man named Masanobu Fukuoka, and he was a uh, plant pathologist working uh, during approximately World War II. He he was responsible for helping the Japanese people to be able to provide enough food for themselves during the wartime. And afterwards, he had kind of this revelatory moment and said, wait a minute, nature manages to produce all these plants, Mm -hmm. and there's no gardener which means somehow they've, they, they, there is a self-sustaining system here that works without human intervention. That actually does occasionally grow raspberry bushes. By yes! Itself, right, as I found out. And so what if, what, and compare that to farming where we're adding, uh, where we're adding fertilizer to the soil to try to get it to grow, where we're having to add pesticides and herbicides and where we have to till up the ground all the time. And he says, wait a minute, nature doesn't till. So mm. is there any way for me to get a, a productive farm that does not require any of these, shall we call them, unnatural human inputs or just mm-hmm. excessive human inputs. Is there a way to do it with less overt interference? Yes. And so he tried and, to create... And still do it, right? Like you actually yes. do want to grow food and live. Yes, that's that's a prerequisite. You need that in order to keep going. And so he went back to the family farm and uh, tried to take over and uh, tried to apply these principles and in the process of doing, managed to wipe out a whole bunch of mandarin orange trees by accident and then you know replanted them and tried again. But eventually he got his little two-acre patch of rice to be self-sustaining with no tilling, no fertilizer, no watering except for a couple weeks out of the year. 
and uh, no herbicides, no pesticides. Like he managed to do it. And his yields were competing favorably with all of his neighbors. In some cases, hmm. he was out competing them in terms of yield per acre, hmm. which is incredible. And all of this is the premise of, per- of permaculture, basically. Yes. Right. And so he was talking about one of the, th- the point about the Japanese farmers, the one that Joseph just mentioned, was that he would take visitors after he got this farm up and running up to visit a particular Shinto shrine near his home. And in this shrine, it was loaded with poetry. There's poetry on the walls. There's poetry everywhere. And uh, he would say this, this shrine that is from, I think it was like the 16th century. Mm-hmm. It's old. And these poems were written by the local farmers, which tells you two cool things. One, that the farmers were writing poetry and therefore were capable of writing poetry. That implies things about literacy, about their ability to work with language, about mm-hmm. um, their, their free time mm-hmm. as, a, as a major thing, how much free time they had. And he would use it to emphasize the point about free time, that they were able to dedicate basically the entire winter to reading, to poetry, to playing with the grandkids. And they had this sort of lifestyle where you compare that to modern farmers where we're so input heavy Mm -hmm. that farmers never take vacations. And if they do, they need somebody else to be covering, you know, Mm -hmm. because you need to be managing all this extra stuff. Well, I mean, as as somebody who's worked on a cherry farm, uh, they, as far as I know, they do. It's just, but they don't take all winter off. Yeah. There's, There's plenty of stuff to do. And I, I, I'm sure they were doing things like mending tools and other stuff. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not like there's never nothing to do. Sure. I, but there's nothing enough to do that you can spend some time writing poetry. Yeah. And that, to me, is a beautiful concept. I love the idea yeah. of, of the independent farmer with a high-class education. Yeah. Who is just kind of sustaining. Well, and can I say something about that, which is that <clears throat> there's the, the whole split between uh, sort of white collar and blue collar jobs is so interesting to me. Uh, I've been I've, I've been thinking about that and uh, well for one thing it's a source of a lot of political tension in the United States sure right now right and a lot of a lot of unrest partially because you know a, a lot of the economic gains of the last few decades and so forth has been uh, has been transferred onto the white collar class but or onto the uh, onto, onto the upper classes but not so much onto the lower classes let's say it's starting to shift a little bit. Right. And so the, the unified vision, if I could wax like a little bit utopic in my thinking for just one minute, just indulge me for one moment. Right. Um, I can't help but wonder, is something like this combination of liberal arts and Georgics education, like would that solve a lot of political conflict maybe? Because you can't, you, you can't peat, you can't, you, you can't pit uh, y- y- uh, people with PhDs against uh, mechanics if they're the same people. Yeah. Right. Uh, if it's the mechanic that has a PhD. Or uh, or the uh, PhD Matthew, or the Matthew PhD Crawford. who has decided to also be a mechanic. Matthew Crawford wrote a book. So quick, quick tie-in for permaculture. So the two-week course was on permaculture. It was a permaculture design course. I'm now certified. Woohoo! hoo um, That's actually I'm hoping there will thing. be some videos about this in the um, The San future. Juan Permaculture Institute uh, housed at Monticello College is where I did it, taught by Josh Choate. Uh, excellent course. Um, but... These ideas of how to create a self-sustaining agriculture, mm-hmm. uh, one of these luminaries is Masanobu Fukuoka. So that's a good book to get you started on permaculture. Uh, as far as PhDs who are also mechanics, there's mm-hmm. a book called um, Shop Class as Soulcraft by Matthew Crawford. And in that book, um, he gets a PhD in philosophy and thinks he wants to be a philosopher and pursue that full time. And it turns out that he actually finds it a more intellectually satisfying work mm-hmm. in being a motorcycle mechanic. And he talks about the relationship between the, the, the building up of the soul and the building up of what it is to be human and to live well mm-hmm. with these often disparaged manual trades. Mm-hmm. And he talks particularly about the diagnostic thought process that it is required to figure mm-hmm. out what's wrong with the motorcycle. It, it's like computer programming but worked out in steel. Yes. And, I mean, once you learn how to mold steel and do things with it, you feel empowered. I mean, mm-hmm. you can make manifest stuff in the real world, Mm -hmm. but also you're you're applying the same, like it's the scientific method. There's a thing wrong. Okay. Let's start eliminating variables. Is it this? Is the electrical system? No. Is it this system? Mm Yes. Okay. Which part? And then what went wrong? And then how do we fix it cheaply and efficiently? I mean, you're balancing all these things. It's actually a really complicated thing. Yeah. So anyway, I, I am tremendously interested in their project of mixing liberal arts education with, shall we say, manual arts education, hands-on education. And I think it, it, it bodes well for the future of the world. Well, it's like it's, it's a cool thing. Yeah, 
And uh, and honestly, like the the whole bizarre like crafts and philosophy split that we do on this channel is kind of that. <laughs> <laughs> like it is, and so, it's bizarre. Congratulations, Joseph! You just came home. <laughs> yes, that's kind of how it felt, just a little bit. Um, I mean, their infrastructure—they yeah, yeah, yeah. still need to build more of their buildings. Yeah. Right now, I, I would compare the infrastructure level at the college to that of a scout camp. Um, you know, I lived in a nice little cabin uh, while I was there, and it was good, but it was a cabin with you know a screen door and running water. Uh, no, the main building has running water. From so uh, we do get to in. we do get to test the whole Roman pottery toilet paper. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, fortunately we didn't have to go that far. But if we had to, we now know that's possible. Yeah, yeah. Okay, are we? Have we? Yep, I think I've covered everything we need to cover. Okay, hey guys, thanks so much for listening. This has been really great. Again, you can find more information, including some uh, some links to some of the books that we've mentioned in the show notes and video description and so on and so forth. Um, got a lot of great stuff planned coming up in the future, so we appreciate your support. And uh, these were two really good, two really good little adventures. Yeah. So hope you've hope you've learned something. We certainly feel like we did. More in the future. Thanks Thank very you. much, and bye bye. <laughs>